Welcome to WatchGuard's Daily Security Byte DEF CON edition, and welcome to day two of DEF CON. I'm Corey Knockreiner, and with me is... Mark Law Liberty. And today we're here to talk about what we saw at DEF CON, so why don't we just hop right in with you, Mark? What did yeah. you see? So we actually went to quite a few talks today, uh, despite our CTF challenge still going on throughout the day. Uh, one of the ones that jumped out at me was actually put on by Joseph Cox from Motherboard. Cool. Uh, as a journalist. I've read for, him. <laughs> yep, exactly. Uh, if you're in the tech space and you read a lot of news, you've probably read something by Joseph Cox. But he talked on the topic of uh, how you can buy AT&T, T-Mobile, Sprint, uh, real-time location data on the black market. And, and even was, Verizon, apparently, through alternate means. Even Verizon. <laughs> so he basically walked through... The, uh, the layers of abstraction that these carriers used to have between the mobile data that they collected from users, whether it be um, tower location or GPS assisted location. Yeah, the uh, two types of data. One is cell and that's via tower triangulation. Yeah. And that seems like it's within blocks at best, but it could be even tens of blocks. Yep. But then the other one was A, A hyphen GPS, which it's down to meters, right? I yeah, mean, they double digit. Out, you could picture, find the location of someone within their house, basically, yeah. using this. But anyways, uh, up until, I think, earlier this year, was it? Um, these mobile carriers that he mentioned were selling this information to not just law enforcement, but private companies. Yeah. They did kind of try and restrict it to, like, people that might have a use for it, like uh, bounty hunters or people that are repossessing cars. And well, they, they also it. had like EULAs that the people that were buying it were supposed to honor. And they even had wording in their EULAs that you're supposed to contact the customer via text to let them know when they're being located. But, but it wasn't they, they, enforced. It wasn't enforced in any way. It was just kind of, maybe it wasn't even a EULA. It was more like in best practices. And then some of the third parties kind of removed that that limitation from their usage. Yep, exactly. And so he, this whole thing started when he received a, a tip from someone, uh, an unnamed source, saying, hey, I can buy location data for anyone. Give me a US phone number and I'll prove it to you. Yep. And this kind of jumped him down the rabbit hole uh, where he found this these different layers of carriers selling this information to uh, location aggregators who then sold it to da data brokers who then sold it to the end client, which are like these bounty hunters or whatever. But then a second layer where these private organizations were turning around and selling that data on these like super nondescript hidden websites. Yeah. Like he mentioned one website where if you go to it, uh, it's based, it has a old like, like late nineties under construction, sorry, uh, we'll be here eventually thing. But if you go to a specific page, there's a login form where you can log into this website yeah. and he showed screenshots of administrator access where there were like 200 something companies that had access to yeah. basically request and pay for location lookups through this service then through up all those channels to the original data carrier. And it's unclear, I mean, it didn't sound like these bounty hunters always use in the best way, but it's unclear if this like one site was entirely bad or if it was insiders. Like there were some admins that seemed to be reusing their admin credentials and kind of selling it. So it's so hard to say if all those 250 bounty hunters misused it or if some just bad actor inside was reselling to the underground. Yep, and so they went through the whole journalistic process. This actually was a story from earlier this year, I think I mentioned. Yeah. Uh, they contacted them as of uh, a few months ago, AT&T, T-Mobile, Sprint said they're no longer selling people's data. Turns out Verizon uh, had stricter rules on this. Yeah, they always were a little better. In fact, they enforced on their end uh, notifying an individual when they were being tracked. And that's a key service. difference. I mean, some of the other carriers, they would say you need to inform the person before doing it, but they left it up to the third party and to do it. informing, they required active text. consent from Yeah, them yeah, too. you'd have to send a text and they'd have to say, yes, you can track me. <laughs> Who would do that? Exactly. But uh, like you say, Verizon was actually doing that on their end. There was supposed to be no way around it. Yep. So it was an interesting talk hearing about some of the shadier sides of the internet. I personally, I don't understand why they would ever think it's okay to sell this information to a private company in the first place, but whatever. Well, the Cox brought up all kinds of interesting things like uh, stalkers would be using this. You know, the bounty hunters, who knew what they sold it to, but it could be some stalker that could literally follow you. And 
how real time it was seemed to be have to do with how much you pay. You could ping all day long. They, they call these pings. You get a ping and it shows you a location. And if you did that, you know, continuously, you could follow a person all over the place. Yep. So really dang dangerous creepy. Information. And I'm glad they're changing their practices. Yeah. By the way, uh, obviously you should listen to the 443, the best podcast ever. But Motherboard <laughs> does have a podcast. And they actually covered this. I'd, I'd heard a lot of this before on a podcast. Yeah. So how yeah. about you? What talks did you see? So one of the interesting talks that I went to just for fun. I don't know how much practical stuff today you can really take away from it, but it was called Hacking Your Thoughts, Batman Forever Meets Black Mirror. And it was given by a, a PhD researcher, someone that went to UW, by the way, Katherine Pratt, who now works somewhere else, and she goes by the alias Gattacat. And it basically has to do with, you know, I think you and I have talked about Neuralink, Elon Musk's company to get the brain-computer interface. And brain-computer interfaces, or BCIs, are becoming more and more realistic. Uh, so she talked about some of the privacy impl implications of that data. Now, she started the talk by, by kind of defudding how good brain-computer interfaces are. Uh, we're not at the point, you know, the evasive ones that Musk... Musk recently had a talk showing some of the Neuralink uh, research where they actually inserted things in rats' heads. Yeah. But uh, she says some of the, you know, that is a little too dangerous. You shouldn't do that yet. She uses the caps. The amount of data you can really get, it's not like people can read your thoughts yet. But they have done studies where, you know, they can have you, one of the studies was they had five different pieces of jewelry. They would ask a subject to steal one and hide it. But then later on, they would show pictures of all those pieces of jewelry while you had this BCI cap plugged into your head. And they could predict which one you had taken based on that interesting or, or guessing numbers uh, she did an untrained test where there's no training they would just get you to pick a number one from ten and then they'd see if the computer could guess which one you picked and one of the interesting things for untrained tests like that where you just have to pick something random the computer only guessed right three out of ten times which actually is pretty good according to her but isn't great as far as statistics yet but it, it, it still was interesting, but was more interesting than that, they l compared, uh, so when they're doing these tests, when you're more attentive when you're taking the test, as they're testing subjects, people get bored and stop paying attention. So one of the things she does is make you press a space bar. If you're more attentive while you're taking the test, the computer's better at guessing your number, huh. because apparently your brain is paying attention to your number more. But another interesting thing, about six out of 10 times, the next number, the, the number the computer guessed that was wrong was predictively guessing the next number that you were going to choose. Oh, that's creepy. And that's because of the, she theorized maybe you were thinking that you're sick of being in this test, so you're thinking about the number to come next just to hurry it along. But anyways, first she showed how it is possible for this brain-computer interface to do stuff, including predictive information. It's still really early, so there's not much great there. But one day, this is going to be some serious information. I Imagine. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I'm not looking forward to the data breaches of Elon Musk's Neuralink or whatever that well, ends yeah. up with my thoughts on She's the dark like web. She's like, if uh, maybe for video gaming, we hook this up to play video games, but then of course, micropayment game companies are going to put in like little pictures of different coffee logos in their games, and then they'll see which one that react we react to. Oh, Mark likes Starbucks coffee, and suddenly your game is going to get targeted advertising based on this subtle crap that's going on in your brain while you play a game. So she talked about that and then she talked about some of the privacy laws and how nobody's covering BCI information and privacy yet. It's related to biometrics and we really ought to think about that. So it's kind of interesting. I'm kind of interested in things like deep dive VR so I'm interested in this Neuralink stuff. Interesting. Uh, but it does seem like it's we need to think about the privacy implication now, but I think this technology is at least a decade away. Yep. Uh, hopefully we figure out that privacy implication sooner rather than later, though. Yep. Anything else cool? Yeah. So another talk I went to was a totally just for fun talk uh, put on by Bill Swearingen, who I guess has been a goon or like a party organizer for DEF CON for something like 15 years or so. Wow. He's been around for a long time, but this was his first talk, I believe. And he uh, his talk was titled Hack the Police. <laughs> um, hack with a, a KC yeah. instead of CK because he's from Kansas City. Yeah. Uh, but really his talk was all about uh, radar and speed gun and laser uh, speed gun detections. And so he started out his talk going over his history in the area where I guess he, uh, as part of his previous history, he had developed a, a tool to 
abuse the MIRT, so the uh, mobile infrared uh, transmitter devices that uh, police cars and buses use to get green lights at uh, cool. signs. Yeah, yeah, so they can change the lights. Turns out that's super illegal to mess with or even sell these days. Uh, so he kind of jumped off that back bandwagon and now he started looking at speed guns. And so he started out talking about radar speed guns and how they use the Doppler effect to predict how fast you're going. Yeah. And you can jam that by sending out a signal at the exact right frequency for like saying I'm going at 65 miles an hour if you know the original frequency. But that's kind of dangerous too, right? He pointed out that is federally illegal, uh, regulated by the FCC, and on a federal level, it's a uh, like a fifty thousand dollar fine and five years in prison. Oh damn! Uh, mm -hmm. If you're caught radar jamming, but then he jumped into the new uh, laser uh, speed trap detection systems, where because people have radar detectors, you can a radar detector is actually good these days. You can pick yeah. it up like two miles away, so cops are moving towards laser uh, based detectors where you cannot detect them until you are being hit and being marked. Yeah. Um, but turns out that the light spectrum is not regulated by the FCC. It's regulated by the FDA, and it is not currently... So wait a second. You, you just said FDA, the Federal Drug the Administration? The Food and Drug, Food Administration, and Drug Administration, Administration regulates the light spectrum. Huh. I, whatever. I guess I eat lasers for breakfast. <laughs> Don't we all? Yes. Um, but it's not federally illegal to mess with this stuff. Also, because it is actually heavily regulated, because if you get a laser wrong, you blind someone, yeah. uh, they all have to use a specific spectrum, a specific color, like uh, non-visible infrared light. Uh, it was like 904 nanometers. Huh. Um, and because of this, it's really easy to build something to, say, jam them. Yeah, you know exactly what to look for. So he, his whole talk was actually building up to releasing this open source tool that's built off a uh, ESP8266 uh, which is the predecessor hey. for our ESP32 chips that we have okay. in our badges. Uh, some LEDs, some 904 nanometer LEDs, uh, and then a uh, hook into an app, basically. Hmm. And long story short, he built a tool where it will, within one pulse from these laser detectors, figure out what the model is of the laser te detector and then send back a pulse that basically wow. makes it so it looks like you're going zero miles an hour. Oh, perfect. And it works for a whole bunch of them. Uh, so there's screw a those helicopters that are shooting lasers at me from the sky. Exactly. There's a few where it doesn't quite work for it. He called out to the audience to uh, use their hacker skills to try and reverse engineer those and add them to the open source tool as well. Cool. But it was it was a fascinating and a really interesting talk. Uh, his tool is called uh, Nacha Kacha. So his original <laughs> tool is Kacha. This is Nacha Kacha. It also has a, an MIRT mode, oh. which you mentioned is highly illegal to use, so don't use it, but it's there. <laughs> but long story, it was a, a hilarious talk. The guy was a great speaker, and it was a fun I'm topic. I'm sure if it's a goon, he does the classic DEF CON fun talk. Yep, exactly. Yeah. Cool. So how about you? Anything else? So I think we both went to, the, the last one was, it was kind of cool. It wasn't super groundbreaking, but we both went to one called Co Unpackaging PKGs, which of course is a Mac OS package. When you're installing a new program, that tends to be the format you get. Uh, the subtitle was a look inside Mac OS packages and common security flaws. And essentially, uh, I thought it was interesting just in him enumerating how PKGSs work. Uh, you know, he talked about the, the utility all Mac Macs have to unpackage them is called uh, pack utils, I think. And if you run that, it will unpack something into a folder. But he really wanted to know what happened there. So he talked about tricks like how you could use ZARXF to manually open a package because it was a, essentially just a, an archive. A, a, an archive, yes. And it would de-archive it into separate scripts you could look at. Then there were also scripts and packages, packages which you'd also have to unpack. And he really laid out how it goes about installing a package on a Mac OS computer, including some of the scripts used to kind of install things. And then he went through, he didn't really share what, what uh, vendors had vulnerable package installers, but he went through a number of vulnerabilities he found in some of the scripts of installer packages that could do everything from elevate you to root to delete random direct or delete arbitrary directories on your computer e. using root privileges and stuff like that just because it was bad scripting things like su doing certain tasks and he could take advantage of that or or maybe su doing a folder so he could just put some of his his source or I'm sorry his shell code into some other folder first Man. it's a kind of interesting talk if you wanted to know how packages uninstalled or and and what they contained. And there are ways to, to uh, 
e exploit them for privilege escalation. Now, you obviously have to already be on a system to do a lot of what he said. So this is more about privilege ef escalation. If you have some administrator controlling your Mac and you want root, hey, maybe maybe get him to install a package for you this way. Yeah, still an interesting talk, though. Yeah, it was like a very was interesting talk. By the way, I if I didn't mention... With. Oh, sorry. I said something I wasn't familiar yeah, with. Yeah, for me, it was just a nice little education about uh, PKGS files. Uh, the the guy's name was, oops, Andy Grant is the, the guy that did it. And he's from, I think, NCC Group, yep. uh, who we've dealt with before. Yeah, so cool yeah. stuff. I think this yeah. is probably our last one because we yeah, got early flights. Yeah, this is probably our, our last uh, video for DEF CON. I'll actually be at some talks tomorrow, but we won't have another on-site video. Maybe we can cover some in a 443 later if anything cool pops up. Yep. But nonetheless, thank you guys for watching. It's been fun. Wish you could be here. Yeah, see you around. Cheers.